Hello, I'm Rose Reeb Suit, and today I'm reading the second part of 12 Degrees of Humility and Pride by St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Chapter 3 The process by which the vote of humility leads to the attainment of truth, the three degrees of truth, the teaching of Christ about these, discussion of the difficulty involved in the statement that he learned compassion through suffering. I have stated, as well as I can do so, the blessings to be gained by passing upwards through the degrees of humility. I will now, to the best of my ability, explain the process by which these lead to the promised prize, the attainment of truth. But as the recognition of truth is gradual, I will, if I can do so, indicate its three degrees in order to make it more clear to which of these the twelfth degree of humility leads. I will note that the three degrees of truth come after the twelve degrees of humility, as you can only embark on that journey of truth after humility, as stated in the previous episode. We seek the truth in ourselves, in our neighbors and its essential nature. We find it first in ourselves by severe self-scrutiny, then in our neighbors by compassionate indulgence, and finally in its essential nature by that direct vision which belongs to the pure in heart. Observe both the number and the sequence. To begin with, let him who is the truth teach you that you must search for truth in those around you before you look for it in its intrinsic purity. You will afterwards learn why you must search for it in yourself before you do so in your neighbors. Thus, in the enumeration of the Beatitudes in his sermon, he placed the merciful before the pure in heart. The merciful quickly discover truth in their neighbors when they extend their sympathy to them, and so kindly identify themselves with them that they feel their good and evil characteristics as if they were their own. They are weak with those that are weak. With those who are offended they burn. They have made it their habit to rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. When their spatial vision has been made clear and acute by this brotherly love, they delight to gaze on truth for its own sake, and in their affection for it, they are indulgent to its errors which are not their own. But how can those who, so far from thus associating themselves with their brethren, insult them in their sorrow and divide them in their joy, possibly discern truth in their neighbors? seeing that they cannot enter into the feelings of others about things of which they have no personal experience. Well, indeed, does the common saying fit them? A healthy man has no idea of the feelings of one who is ill, nor does a well-fed man realize what a hungry man suffers. A sick man feels for the sick, and a hungry man, feel a hungry man for the hungry familiarity, the greater as his own condition approaches theirs, or as pure truth can be discovered only by those whose pure heart is pure, so can the sorrow of a brother be most truly felt by those whose heart is sad. But if your heart is to be saddened by the sorrows of others, you must recognize your own evil state, which you may see reproduced in your neighbor and may thus know how to help him. And in this you have the example of our Savior, who is willing to suffer that he might know how to sympathize, to accept sorrow that he might thus learn to pity, for as it is written of him, he learned through obedience for the things which he suffered. So may he have suffered that he might learn compassion. This, however, does not mean that he, whose compassion was eternal in its origin and its duration, hath not hitherto known pity, but that what he knew in his nature, in an eternal, he learned by experience in a temporal sphere. But you may find it difficult to accept my statement that Christ, who is the divine wisdom, learned compassion. 
as though it were possible for him through whom all things were made. Ever to have been ignorant of anything, especially in the view of the fact that the passage from the epistle to the Hebrews, which I have adduced in the support of my argument, may be understood in a different sense, which would not involve us in this difficulty, for on this interpretation, the words he learned would for not to his own person, but to his body, which is the church. In that case, the meaning of the sentence, and he learned obedience, by the things that he suffered would be that he learned obedience in his body to which he suffered personally. What was the meaning of that death, that cross those insults, spittings, and stripes, all of which Christ, who is our head, endured, unless that they afford to us who are his body convincing evidence of his obedience? Christ saith Paul, became obedient to his father, even unto death. What was the need for such obedience? Let the apostle Peter give the answer. I suffered for us, leaving to you an example that you should follow his steps. That is that you shall imitate his obedience. So from his sufferings we learn how much we who are mere men must be prepared to endure for the sake of obedience, the exercise of which he, who is also God, did not hesitate to die. This, you may say, is the sense in which it is not unreasonable to, al to allege that Christ learned obedience or compassion, or anything else during his earthly life, though you at the same time believe that it was not possible for him to acquire while on earth any knowledge which he did not previously possess in his divine person. Thus, he might himself both alone and teach pity and obedience, since the head and the body is one Christ. I do not deny that this verse may reasonably be thus understood, but the formal interpretation seems to be supported by another passage in the same epistle, in which it is said, Nowhere doth he take hold of the angels, but the seed of Abraham he taketh hold. Wherefore it behooved him in all things to be like unto his brethren, that he might become merciful. I think that these words have so close a reference to his person that they cannot be altogether applicable to his body. It is at any rate said of the word of God that he took that is, he incorporated into his own personality, not angels, but the seed of Abraham. The passage reads, Not the word was made an angel, but the word was made flesh. And that from the flesh of Abraham, in accordance with the promise made to him, whereupon, that is, by reason of this assumption of the seed, he ought, in all things, to be like unto his brethren. That is to say, it was right and necessary that he should be, as we are susceptible to suffering, and should share with us every kind of misfortune, with the exception of sin. If you ask, wherefore this ne necessity, the answer is that he may become merciful. And you may say, why may not this be properly understood as referring to his body? But listen to the words which so closely follow these, or that wherein he himself hath suffered and been tempted, he is able to secure them also that are tempted. And for these words I can see no better meaning that he was pleased thus to suffer and to be tempted to associate himself with all human misery except sin, which is what being like unto his brethren in all things means, in order that he might learn by personal experience to pity, to feel for those who similarly suffer and are tempted. I do not say that this experience added to his knowledge, that it brought him closer to us, so that the weak sons of Adam, whom he has not disdained to make his own, and to call his brethren, 
need not hesitate to bring their infirmities to him, who, recognizing what he has himself endured, as God, is able, and as the neighbor is desirous to provide the remedy. For this reason, Isaiah calls him a man of sorrows, acquainted with of infirmity. And the apostles say, We have not a high priest who cannot have compassion our, on our infirmities. And to show how he can have such compassion, the writer adds, But one tempted in all things, like as we are without sin. Surely the blessed God, while in that form in which he thought it is not robbery to be equal with God, was beyond doubt incapable of suffering before he had emptied himself and taken the form of a slave, and, has, and as he had no experience of sorrow or subjection, he had no opportunity of practicing either compassion or obedience. Yet, indeed, a natural but not experimental knowledge of these, yet as he not only laid aside his own dignity, but was made a little lower than the angels, who by favor and not by nature are incapable of suffering, he took a form in which it was possible for him to suffer and to submit, which as has been stated, he could not have done in that form which was his own, Thus, by suffering, he learned compassion, by subjection, obedience. This experience, however, led, as I have pointed out, to an increase not of wisdom on his part, but of confidence on, all, on ours. Since by the knowledge thus painfully acquired, he from whom we had been so widely separated was brought nearer to us, or when would we dare to approach him? while he was incapable of suffering. And now the apostle advises and exhorts us to go with confidence to the throne of grace, whereon is he whom we shortly recognize as the one of whom it is elsewhere written that he hath borne our infirmities and carried our sorrows, and of whose power to sympathize with us in what he has himself endured we cannot we can entertain no doubt. But there appears to be no contradiction on the one hand in saying that as there is nothing of which Christ was ever unaware, his knowledge could have no commencement, and on the other hand in maintaining that while in his divine nature. He knew compassion from all eternity in another capacity. He learned it under bodily and temporal conditions and to note the similar language which our Lord used when in reply to a question from his disciples, he pleaded ignorance of the date of the last day. For how could he, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, be unaware of that day? How could he, for whom ignorance of any sort was clearly impossible to say that he did not know, could he possibly desire to conceal by a subterfuge information which he could not profitably disclose? God forbid the thought, but neither could he, who is wisdom, be unaware of anything, nor could he, who is truth, be incapable of falsehood. But in his desire to discourage the useless curiosity of the disciples, he pleaded ignorance of the matter about which they asked him, not indeed without qualification, but in a way in which he could truthfully disclaim such knowledge. For although his divine insight, ranging over all things past, present, and future, he had that day clearly before him, it was still true that he was unaware of it by the exercise of any bodily sense. Had it been otherwise, he would already have slain Antichrist with the breath of his mouth, would have heard with his bodily ears the shout of the archangel and the sound of the trumpet at whose call the death dead are to rise, would have surveyed with his bodily eyes the sheep and the goats, who are then to be separated from each other. But with the intention of making it clear that it was only in the sphere of that intelligence 
which he possessed in his human capacity that he, so did his ignorance of that day. He was careful in his answer not to say, I do not know, but, but of that day or hour, no man knoweth, neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father. Apologies. Let's see. He was careful in his answer not to say, I do not know, but the Son of Man himself doth not know. So, I will note that this is a misquotation of Mark chapter 13 verse 32, of which I read originally as a mistake. I had it on hand. <laughs> uh, let us continue. But what is this title of Son of Man? But the one which he assumed on taking on himself our nature. By its use here, he means it to be understood that when he says that he is ignorant of anything, he is speaking not as God but as man. But on the other hand, he refers to his own Godhead. He usually says not the Son or the Son of Man, but I or we in the passage, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was made, I am. He there speaks of himself as I, not as the Son of Man. There can be no doubt that he then referred to that existence which was his before Abraham, and which never had a beginning, not to what he became after the time of Abraham and by descent from him. And when he elsewhere asks his disciples what men think of him, he says, Whom do men say, not, not that I am, but that the Son of Man is? But when he afterwards asks the same disciples what they themselves felt about him, he says, But whom do you say, not, not that the man not that the Son of Man is, but that, that I am. So when he asks the opinion of worldly persons about his bodily nature, he uses the term Son of Man, but when he questions his spiritual followers about his Godhead, he significantly says, not the Son of Man, but me, that Peter understood what he meant by putting the question in this form, is apparent from his reply, for he says, Thou art, not the Son, not Jesus the Son of a Virgin, but Christ the Son of God. Had he made the former reply, he would have said, What is no less true, but shrewdly, gathering from the wording of the question the meaning of him who put it, he gave a suitable and sufficient answer, saying, Thou art Christ the Son of God. Now, from this you may see that Christ has two natures, albeit in one person. In one which he has always existed, the other in which he had a beginning, that while in that nature, which is eternal, he always knew everything, that which is temporal, he found out many things in the course of time. Why then do we find it difficult to admit that as there was a time when he his bodily existence began, so his knowledge of the ills of the flesh, at all events, that sort of knowledge which bodily weakness conveys, have had a beginning. Our first parents would no doubt have been better and wiser had they not possessed knowledge of this sort, since they could acquire it only through folly and misfortune, but God their creator seeking what had been lost in his mercy followed up his own handiwork, he himself mercifully descended to the level from which they had miserably fallen, and was willing himself to endure what they deservedly suffered through their disobedience to him. This not from a curiosity like theirs, but from marvelous love, his purpose being not to remain in misery with the unfortunate, but to become merciful and so to deliver them from their misery. When I say that he became merciful, I refer not to that compassion, 
which had been his in his eternal condition of bliss, but to that which he acquired through the medium of misfortune. While he bore our nature, moreover, completed in the latter the work of love, which he had commenced in the former state, he could undoubtedly have made it complete in the former alone, but without the latter it would not have been effectual for us. Both forms were essential, the latter more closely concerns ourselves. How indescribable is the method of his goodness? Could we ever have understood that marvelous mercy unless previous suffering had been had given it shape? Could we have discerned his sympathy of which we had no knowledge if he had no previous suffering and had remained insusceptible to pain? Yet, had he not possessed the compassion which knows no misfortune, he would have never attained that whose misfor mother's misfortune. If he had not attained this, he could not have drawn it to himself. If he had not so drawn it, he could not have brought it out. And whence did he bring it out if not from the pit of misery and mire of dregs? Yet he did not abandon that earlier compassion, but added it to the latter. Did not alter, he augmented it. As it is written, Men and beasts thou wilt preserve, O God. O oh, how hast thou multiplied thy mercy, O God? Chapter 4 The first degree of truth, self-scrutiny, reveals to us our own evil case. Let us resume the thread of our argument. If then he, in whose nature there was no sadness, made himself sad, in order that he might have personal experience of something of the existence of which he was already aware, how much more is it your duty? I will not say to alter but to recognize your condition, which is indeed a pitiable one, and thus to learn compassion, for which could not, could otherwise have no knowledge. Or it may well happen that by dwelling on the shortcomings of your neighbor without sufficient attention to your own, may be moved not to pity but to anger, not to assist but to condemn, so to destroy in a spirit of wrath rather than to restore in a spirit of meekness. Ye who are spiritual, saith the apostle, instruct such an one in the spirit of meekness. The counsel, I, the command of the apostle, is that you should aid your ailing brother the same kindly spirit in which you would wish to be helped when you are ailing. And to show how it is possible to be forbearing towards a wrongdoer, as he says, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And please to note how well the disciple of truth follows the sequence of the master and the Beatitudes to which I have already referred, the merciful, who named before the pure in heart, as are the meek before the merciful, and the apostle when he exhorted those who were spiritual to restore such were carnal, added, in the spirit of meekness. The reformation of the brethren is the mark of the merciful, and a spirit of meekness that of the humble. He says, in effect, that no one who is not himself meek can be reckoned among the merciful. Note that the apostle here clearly is, so it's exactly what I said just now that I would establish. That truth must be sought in ourselves before we can look for it in others, for he says, consider thyself, by which he means, think how easily you may be tempted liable you are to sin, so that by self-scrutiny you may be made humble, and by thus come to the aid of others in a spirit of meekness. If however you heed not the warning of the apostle, tremble before the rebuke of the master. Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam, 
out of thine eye, and thus shalt thou see to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Pride in the mind is like a thick heavy beam in the eye, whose excessive size is due not to health but to vanity, swelling rather than to strength. It so darkens the mental vision as to hide the truth. If then it has taken hold of your mind, you will be unable to see yourself as you really are, or to appreciate either your actual or possible condition. But you will fancy that you all or will become just what you would like to be. For what is pride if not, as a certain holy man defines it, appreciation of one's own goodness? If this be so, we may say, on the other hand, that humility is the disparagement of one's own goodness. Love and hatred alike ignore the verdict of truth. Would you like to hear what that verdict is? As I hear, so I judge, not as I hate or as I love, nor as I feel. There is the judgment of hate, such as that which said, We have a law, and according to a law, he ought to die. And there is a judgment of fear, like that one, if we let him alone, so the Romans will come and take away our place and nation. There is a judgment of love, as that of David on the son would have slain his father. Spare the boy, Absalom. And I know that it is the rule of human law which is binding alike in ecclesiastical and in civil actions that personal friends of the litigants shall not be allowed to take part in the proceedings, lest through their affection for their friends they may be misled or may mislead others. And if aff affection for a friend leads you to extenuate or even conceal his guilt, how much more will self-esteem preclude an unfavorable verdict upon yourself? So the man who is really anxious to discover the truth about himself must first remove the beam of pride which prevents him from seeing the light, must propose in his heart to ascend by steps at which he must scrutinize his inmost self. And by the twelfth degree of humility, we pass on the first degree of truth. But when a man has found truth in himself, or rather has found himself in truth, so that he can say, I believe, and therefore have I spoken, but I have been bundled exceedingly. He may rise to a high spiritual level in order that truth may be held up and may say in his ecstasy, every man is a liar. Do you not suppose that this was the trend of David's thought? Do you not, do not you think that the prophet felt as did the Lord, as did the apostles, and as we do? Come after them and share their feelings. I believed, says the man in truth, who says, He that followeth me walketh not in darkness. I therefore showed my faith by following, and expressed it by confessing, and by confessing what? The truth, which I discovered through faith, but afterwards I believed unto righteousness, and made, made confession unto salvation. I was humbled exceedingly. That is entirely. He, appeared, he appears to mean by this, since I was not ashamed by the fact that the truth, which I disowned in myself bore witness against me, it carried humility to its utmost extent. This word exceedingly may mean completely, as in the passage, he shall delight exceedingly in his commandments. But some one may urge that exceedingly is he used for in a high degree, not for completely. That the commentators seem to uphold this interpretation. Even if this be so, there is nothing inconsistent with the meaning of the prophet. 
which we may take as being to this effect. While I was still unaware of the truth, I did indeed suppose myself to be something, whereas I was nothing. But when I afterwards believed in Christ and therefore tried to imitate his humility, I recognized the truth. It was indeed uplifted in me by confession, but I was exceedingly humbled. That is, I was greatly depreciated in my own estimation as a result of my self-scrutiny. Alright. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. If you enjoyed the book, there's a link the playlist in the description below. That's all, and may God bless.